Hey everybody, welcome to Creative Live. My name is Finn McKenty. I'm the head of the music and audio channel here at Creative Live. If you're new to Creative Live, we are the world's leading online classroom for creative professionals. Uh, if you're watching the music channel, that probably means you are interested in all things related to songwriting, engineering, mixing, mastering, uh, everything else that goes into producing music, and you're in the right place. So uh, after you're done watching this, head over to, uh, to creativelive.com slash audio, check out some free previews, see what we have to offer. There's probably something that will interest you. In the meantime, we have uh, our guest, Mike Metley, the editor of Recording Magazine, who is going to chat with us uh, about all things related to setting up a home studio, making all the right choices about the right gear, uh, workflow, all that kind of stuff, and maybe if we're lucky, talk to us about some of the shiniest new toys on the market. So, Mike, thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you, Finn. I'm glad to be back. Uh, what have you been up to this week? I guess uh, you, you haven't hit uh, production craziness yet? Oh, actually, we're uh, in the part of the month that I enjoy the most, which is writing and researching uh, new reviews. Uh, we're actually living in that uh, publisher time warp, so we're working on our October issue, which is going to be going to the Audio Engineering Society convention in New York in October, and I've been playing with some really cool new toys that I'm hoping to be talking about in the October and November issues of the magazine. Uh, for instance, right? There, those are the new uh, Gibson Les Paul uh, reference monitors. We're going to be doing a review of the small four-inch ones and of the six-inch ones. And uh, next to them, which will probably be in the uh, in the November issue, are the new Micromain 45s from Barefoot Sound. So I've been I've been living large and enjoying the fact that I get to play with these cool toys. It's hard to complain about that. So, uh, by the way, if you're new to the Q and A format. If you'd like to ask a question for Mike, over on the right-hand side of this page, you'll see a little thing that says Ask. Just click on that, and you'll see our, our, uh, our questions widget. You type your question there, and then I will ask Mike on your behalf. Um, well, uh, so I guess today I wanted to, again, talk about um, you know, basically just from, from, from the beginning, setting up <laughs> uh, a computer-based recording system, as you put it, since I'm guessing not too many people want to set up a tape-based recording system these days. Well, well, actually, there's still a lot of people who like tape, but if you're getting started, a computer gives you a whole lot of power for very little money. So, yeah, we're going to focus on computers. Yeah, well, let's, let's start with the basics. I mean, the, you know, the, the questions that everyone you know, wants to know, and, and we've probably both heard a million times, should I get a Mac or a PC, and what <laughs> DAW should I get? So okay. What, what, um, is the, what is the answer to those two questions? Well, um, I didn't realize that this was a religion blog. <laughs> uh, um, Mac or PC is something that has been battered around a, for a long time. And fortunately, the answer these days is really, really simple. Whichever platform you're currently comfortable on is the one you should start on because there are advantages to each side when you get to a certain level of technical expertise, when you've been doing this for a while. You may find that certain tools work better for you on the Mac. You may find that a Windows-based platform gives you more flexibility for building out your hardware the way you want. There are even people now who are doing good work on Linux systems, but really, if you're getting started, don't add the confusion and difficulty of learning a new computer operating system to um, the confusion of trying to get a, a studio set up. Uh, my recommendations for what they're worth right now is if you're on a Mac, uh, try at least for now to stick with iOS 10.9 Mavericks. Uh, there are still some issues outstanding in Yosemite, and next month El Capitan is coming out. But Maverick seems to be a good, solid release that gives you most, if not all, of Mac OS's current benefits while being very stable. On the Windows side of things, while there are a lot of people who are singing the praises of Windows 10, which came out last week, or uh, two weeks ago now, I guess, um, the preferred Windows platform right now is Windows 7, uh, Service Pack 1, 
I think. Uh, Windows 7 is nice and stable. It's mature. It is still being supported by Microsoft and by all the various antivirus people. Uh, it will give you a good basis to run from, and there are very few music applications out there that require Windows 8 or greater. So that's my answer as far as uh, OS goes. As far as the DAW goes, that's a real tricky one, and I'll probably talk more about that later in the seminar. There are two things you have to keep in mind when you pick your first DAW. One of them is the kind of music that you want to produce, uh, and the other one is who you're going to be working with. This is really critical because the first DAW you ever install on your computer is going to be the one that you get used to and it's going to be the one that is hardest to move away from if you decide that you want to try something new. Uh, here at uh, Music Maker Publications, we actually have a staffer who is a very talented guitarist, songwriter, and drummer who does a lot of his work on Apple GarageBand. He started when GarageBand was very new. It was very simple. It did everything he needed. As Apple added features to GarageBand, he was able to expand his capabilities. Now he's run into a little bit of uh, a problem because they're starting to scale back what GarageBand does and trying to get people to upgrade to Logic. Uh, but the important thing to realize is if there's a particular genre of music you like to make, look at what people are using in that. Uh, if you're doing movies, even small independent films, you want to look at the Avid stuff like Pro Tools and you want to look at Digital Performer. If you're doing dance music, the logical stuff to look at is Ableton Live or ImageLine FL Studio um, or um, you can now find uh, some good uh, live improvisation and, and loop-based stuff built into Cakewalk Sonar. Uh, of course, you know, as a musical platform, uh, Steinberg Cubase is a, is a good all-rounder. Uh, Nuendo is going to be way out of range for the beginner, but it's uh, a very popular platform for people who are doing post. Um, and if you don't have a lot of money, there are really good introductory programs like uh, Acoustic a mix craft is a fantastic DAW for learning on the PC. Of course, GarageBand is still out there for the Mac. Uh, and there, if you buy a, an audio interface, it's likely that there will be a free version of some piece of software in there that, that can help you get started. A question for you is, uh, how, much, how much interest do you get from your readers in, uh, in Reaper? Because we get a lot of requests for it. It seems like there's a very avid online, no pun intended, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, a, a, a rabid community of Reaper users online. How much uh, do you hear about that in your world? Well, ironically enough, I got a letter this morning from a reader who said, Mike, it's been a while since you've done a walking tour of Reaper in the magazine. Uh, they just released version 5, and I think it would be a good service to the readers to talk about it. Reaper is a very interesting product because uh, it provides a lot of power it is not expensive. The licensing uh, and copy protection terms are extremely lenient, so it's a very easy uh, system to work with. And what I actually recommend, uh, I recommended it a lot until very recently, was that having a copy of Reaper on your computer, especially if you weren't doing a large amount of dollar business every year was a very affordable and easy way to have a sort of a, a, a basic uh, shareable uh, DAW platform that can share files with Cubase or Pro Tools, Digital Performer, Live, and a lot of other things. It's a nice program. It's easy to get into. It works well with a lot of hardware. Uh, it's available on Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, and while it doesn't have a lot of the refinements of even a, a program like Mixcraft, it's a really good platform to know about. Things have changed a little in about the last month or two because Avid has come online with Pro Tools first. Uh, that is a completely free version of Pro Tools that allows for a fair bit of work in small studios, including sharing projects in the cloud. And it is legitimately free. You download it, you use it, there's no licensing, no time bombs, very few limitations. And if you're looking for interoperability, if you want to create stuff that can be taken to a professional studio, that's something well worth keeping in mind. What's what's the uh, you know I, I I was paying attention to the reaction at launch for Pro Tools uh, Pro Tools Pro Tools 12 and Pro Tools First, and 
you know, there was a, a little bit of contentious discussion there. Uh, the dust has settled a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. What would you say the, the community's consensus is on it at this point? Um, we have to face the fact that uh, in many ways in the world of professional audio, especially if you're talking about post-production, Avid is the big dog. Uh, and to some extent, uh, the community has fallen in line uh, still with some grumbling because there are just so many networking features that are now available in these new versions. The whole cloud-based collaboration and the store, you know, you need a plug-in, you push a button inside Pro Tools and you go get it, um, which is not a first, by the way. There are other DAWs that let you do that. But uh, the whole cloud integration of Pro Tools gives you tremendous power. And uh, as a gateway drug, Pro Tools First is a pretty a pretty compelling product. There are always going to be people who hold back. Um, if you've invested twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars in Pro Tools hardware, you're going to be reluctant to move to the new generation if what you've still got is working for you. One, uh, well, actually two or three of our best Pro Tools guys here in uh, here at on the recording uh, contributing writing staff. Um, won't write stuff on Pro Tools 11 or 12 because they're still using old HD hardware and they're they're stuck at Pro Tools 9 or 10 and have no interest in in upgrading yet. On the other hand, we have people like Greg Ogan who, you know, has worked with Kelly Clarkson and Nao and 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 Britney Spears and many other people who is in the process of looking at an upgrade of his studio in LA to Pro Tools 12 and and a full HD X rig. Well, let's uh, let's move on out of the world of software into what I think people know a little bit less about, which is hardware, um, mm -hmm. in particular interfaces and microphones. So, um, kind of talk talk to me a little bit about how to choose. Well, first of all, like briefly, what an audio interface does. Why I shouldn't just you know plug into uh, whatever uh, ports are available on my computer. What an audio interface does, and then. How do I know what microphones I need or don't need? Okay. Well, um, audio interfaces are essentially, these days, all-in-one boxes that are what stands between the music you're making in the analog world and your recorded DAW tracks. They handle conversion into digital and out of digital. They handle uh, recording your microphone signals or signals coming off of your mixer if you have one. They handle playback to your headphones or to your monitors. Uh, and how much you do with them uh, and what you do with them uh, very much depends on what your needs are. And uh, usually what I recommend when you choose an audio interface is that you look at the kind of recording situations that you're really likely to be doing on a regular basis. For example, if you're living at home and you're a singer-songwriter and you have a vocal microphone and a mic for your guitar, you can write your demos, produce them, and get them to the point where you can shop them with only a two-input interface. It doesn't benefit you to spend a lot of extra money on an interface that has a lot of extra uh, input channels. So number, number of inputs is one key factor then when you're evaluating Absolutely. It. Absolutely. The other thing to look at is the connection between the interface and your computer. There are all kinds of connection protocols out there. They all have their pluses and minuses. Uh, depending on the kind of software you're, uh, you're using and depending on the kind of computer you have, what your operating system is, that's going to point you toward or away from certain interface standards. When in doubt, USB 2.0 is still a really good way to go for relatively small channel counts, even if you're working with 2496 audio, because USB 2.0 is plenty fast enough. It's a stupid interface. It's not a smart interface, so you don't have brains in the interface that are talking to the computer. The computer's doing all the heavy lifting. But these days, computers are fast enough so that even a stupid interface can move a lot of data without you having to worry about latency or delays or dropouts. Uh, if you're in the Mac world and you're looking for something that's really, really fast, we're now starting to see interfaces that 
that use the Thunderbolt standard. Uh, Zoom uh, and Resonant Audio have come out with a couple that we've reviewed. Very soon we're going to have a review of the first Focusrite uh, Thunderbolt uh, interface in their new Claret range. Um, so what's what's the benefit of Thunderbolt? You know, I, I I've always had USB interfaces. I've never used a Thunderbolt one. Never really had a never run into a situation where I felt like. USB was was causing a problem. How how would I know if I need to to move to well, Thunderbolt? Well, in, in my opinion, currently, Thunderbolt is not so much a need as a want. Um, there are certain things you can do with Thunderbolt that really don't work that well with USB 2.0. Uh, the most critical one, and the one that I think might really attract a lot of people, is you're familiar with the idea that some of uh, our listeners might not be of zero latency monitoring. The idea is that latency, the delay that is caused when you turn analog signals into digital, you send them down the pipe to the computer, you process them in your DAW, and you bring them back, and then turn them back into analog so you can listen to them. So, like if I have my guitar plugged into a computer. And and uh, I don't have my latency settings, uh, you know, uh, correct. I'll hit the string, and then you know, half a second later, I hear the sound, hear right. the note come exactly. out of my computer. Exactly, but it takes a lot less than half a second to start messing with your hearing. One of the interesting things that most people don't realize is hearing has a much lower threshold for the brain saying something's wrong. Yeah. Uh, than than vision. Uh, I mean, if if I were to flash a flip book at you, showing you 24 pictures per second, your brain would see movement without any jitter. That's the speed of film. You need 44,100 messages per second to hear CD audio. And so, even a delay as little as 10 milliseconds. 15 milliseconds, that'll be enough for you to hear a noticeable delay that will mess with your performance. And even something as low as two or three milliseconds, you'll hear it as flanging or chorusing, uh, which is you know a comb filtered delay between what's going into the DAW and what's coming out. The usual way of handling that on USB interfaces is to provide what's called zero latency monitoring. Basically, there's a little sort of a, a turnoff on the highway right before you get to the converters. Your analog signal is grabbed off the microphone before it gets converted and sent to the computer. It's turned around and it's sent back into your headphones. So there's no latency at all. Now, here's the thing about Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt is so damn fast that when I reviewed my first Thunderbolt interface, I thought that it had built-in reverb in the interface box for zero latency monitoring. So I could have so I could have reverb in my headphones as yeah. I was singing and playing. And when I sent the review in for fact check, they wrote back to me and they said, dude, it's a plug-in. Wow. The interface is running on your computer. Thunderbolt was so fast that it fooled my ears into thinking that I was listening to hardware. And that doesn't happen with USB 2.0 unless you've got a screaming fast computer and you're not pushing a whole lot of data. Sure, okay. So latency is the, is the real advantage there. Yeah. Gotcha. I mean, and, and then, and Thunderbolt uh, interfaces tend to be really expensive. Thunderbolt is not yet a cheap interface. You're going to spend much more money for the same number of inputs and outputs for a Thunderbolt interface than you are for USB. But if you're pushing 16 channels of audio at 2496, uh, USB 2.0 is 4.8 uh, megabits per second, uh, excuse me, 480 megabits per second, about half a gigabit per second. Thunderbolt's 10 gigabits per second. Thunderbolt 2 is 20 gigabits per second. Suddenly, that enormous uh, pipe that you can push your data down becomes an advantage. Well, I want to jump ahead a little bit. I was going to ask you about monitoring and acoustic acoustic treatment, um, mm -hmm. but I think that this this reader question from uh, Raphael might uh, kind of inform some of that, which is, mm -hmm. what's the best option for mastering a project on a low budget? Okay, mastering is tricky um, because mastering accomplishes two different things. One of them is the one we think about all the time. One of them is the one that we don't think about enough. The one we think about all the time is when the mastering engineer evens out the dynamic range of the different tracks that are going to be going out on an album, where uh, the processing that is used 
uh, allows the mix to come across as loud and present without necessarily being distorted or clipped. Um, mastering tools are the way you get your various songs to come across as a coherent whole. The thing that nobody ever talks about that is really the most important part of mastering engineering, always has been and probably always will be, is especially if you work at home and you're doing everything yourself, including tracking and mixing, very often the mastering engineer is the only pair of outside objective ears that listen to your project before you try to sell it to people. If you've made a mistake, if you've got something wrong, if you don't have the level of professionalism either in your technique or your gear to really put that final polish and sheen on your work, a mastering engineer is a relatively affordable way to do that for you and to make sure that you're presenting something that comes across the way you want it to. There are ways to master at home if you're doing something like producing a, a very quick mix of a song that's going to go to a blogger or that is going to be put up on YouTube. Um, there are mastering tools that you can use which will get you into the ballpark for working with compressed audio formats. In fact, there are some really good, very affordable limiter plugins that will run on almost any DAW that we actually review in our uh, September issue, which is just coming out, um, that are from Final Mix, which is uh, the company that is run by LA uh, mix engineer Rob Chirelli. He has a set of very affordable uh, uh, mastering plugins, limiters, uh, parallel drum processors, that sort of thing, that you can get into very easily. And what if you what does affordable mean in the context of, of, <laughs> of mastering plugins? In this particular case, 19 bucks a pop. Okay, that's pretty affordable. <laughs> On the other hand, if you want to spend a little more money and have a really comprehensive set of mastering tools, if you really want to try to do it all at home and you want really good stuff that you can use within your DAW to do the best with your two mixes and your stem, uh, the classic one that everybody talks about is Ozone from Isotope. Ozone 6 is a fantastic uh, 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 program. Um, there is the standard version, which gives you almost everything you're likely to need. The advanced version adds some features and also works as a modular setup where you can actually lower your processor overhead by only using the pieces of the signal chain that you need. Um, we actually do have a review of Ozone 6 Advanced coming up in the next few months, uh, but if it's anything like Ozone 5, Ozone 4, and Ozone 3, which we've all reviewed, it's pretty hard to beat in terms of being able to do mastering at home. Yeah, the I trick, though, the is things. the trick is you want objective ears who don't have a dog in the fight. You want somebody who isn't going to benefit by flattering you and who isn't going to get hurt if they tell you something that you might not want to hear. So You're, in other words, don't, don't play it for your mom because she's going to well, tell you it's great. <laughs> you, you, exactly. You, 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 you know, it's, it's good to get props from, and, and not even your mom, your bandmates. Yeah. You know, if your if your band has recorded an album and it's got problems, the guys who spent all that time tracking, there's a real impulse to say, yeah, it's good enough. Let's get it out the door. Well, yeah, I, and, I have a, a friend, uh, Todd from Nails, if anybody's familiar with the band. Uh, mm -hmm. and one of the, the things I appreciate most about him is that, uh, he has absolutely no filter, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I sent him a song I was working on once. Uh, I was like, "Hey, man, what do you think?" You know, because he's a good songwriter. He's like, "Honestly, man, like, there's absolutely nothing catchy about this. Like, I would mm -hmm. just trash it." <laughs> yeah. Like, okay, well, <laughs> when I was that's what when I, I asked. Yep, and when I was running my own independent label back in the '90s, my rule of thumb was uh, every other release went in the trash without ever being released. Uh, you need to have a real serious focus on quality. You need to be able to take a step back, listen, and really, really make, really make things work. i uh, got a good note from uh, one of the uh, folks in the chat here. Heads up for PC users. Check out the Thunderbolt EX2. It's an add-on card for selected new Asus motherboards. So mm -hmm. apparently there's, th there's Thunderbolt options for PC users as well. 
Yes, but that's that's hardware. The thing you then have to be careful with is you need to make sure there's a Windows Thunderbolt driver for the interface you want to use. That is critical. Gotcha. Windows Windows is always a lot more finicky about drivers. Things that are plug and play under Mac OS for USB, Thunderbolt, that sort of thing. If you want anything more than basic stereo in, stereo out, or aid in, aid out, you need to be sure that you have proper drivers installed and then they will work with your combination of motherboard and expansion card. So test first. Okay, well let's let's continue down the uh, building a home studio journey and talk mm -hmm. about uh, an important part that I think is is still relatively poorly understood by a lot of people, including myself, which is microphones. So you know, all right, huge, I'll huge range of options there. Give us mm -hmm. a give us give us a few uh, good starting points for if if you're on a budget. Sure thing. Uh, now, I'm going to point out, um, the next time we come back and we do one of these seminars, uh, my current hope is that Paul Vanuk Jr., who does a lot of our mic reviews, will be joining us. And I want Paul to basically spend the webinar talking about mics. So we're going to have a chance to go into way more depth the next time about microphones. I what, I am, what I am going to say here, just to get you started, is... Um, there is a real perception right now that th the microphones that are coming over from China that are very affordable and that turn up everywhere are no good. The Chinese microphone manufacturing industry is learning really fast. And mics that are coming out in 2015 are measurably better than mics that were coming out in 2014. And they show no signs of stopping that improvement. So if you are- I know are some of the folks over at uh, SE Electronics and uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, uh, I, I think pretty highly of their products from mm -hmm. what I've used. Well, I actually went to their factory in Shanghai and had a look at it. And they do things the way Neumann did them back in the 1940s. Because uh, it's, it's the, the guy stuff. running the show over there is a microphone geek, right? Oh, he, he yes, he is. Uh, uh, Zhou Xiwei. Um, and um, he uh, he was our host when we were there. Fascinating fellow. Um, the, uh, the interesting thing, though, is they're leveraging technologies that they can use with what China has in plenty, which is raw materials and uh, widely available labor. Uh, you're not going to see high-tech approaches. As mm -hmm. Scott Dorsey pointed out, he said, SE microphones are built the way Neumann built them in the 40s. Neumann is not building microphones that way anymore. You know, with the exception of the U47 FET, which they, they still build the way they used to. But, but there are new methods for quality control. There are new ways of designing and building microphones so that what you're seeing now that's really effective, that's the one-two punch, is R&D that is being done in Europe or the United States, raw materials that are being sourced and built overseas, combined with quality control when the mic arrives at the manufacturer from the, the 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 builder in China or Korea or Taiwan they then tweak the microphones test the microphones reject the ones that are no good and you get a lot of value added for fairly little money um, a really good example of that a company that is that is really taking the world by storm if I may reach behind me for exhibit a um, this is a really cool little microphone for the uh, for the beginner uh, computer musician. Uh, I'm going to be doing a review of this in the October issue. This microphone is from uh, Lewitt, which is a European manufacturer. This particular one is the DGT650. Uh, it's an interesting mic because it gives you all kinds of control over uh, high-pass uh, uh, filtering so that you can get rid of rumble. It has built-in pads that you can switch in and out. It's a stereo mic that can also be used in cardioid mode. This is mic is interesting. It has a lot of the same features as the standard microphones like the LCT series, but it's actually a USB microphone and it has a little uh, box which allows allows you to do stereo input uh, and MIDI. So this is actually a complete singer-songwriter package right here in, wow. uh, in, in one box. And what's the price point on that? Uh, I'm not sure offhand. I believe it comes in at around three fifty or four hundred. Okay. Uh, don't yeah. quote me on that. Uh, other uh, microphones that have been doing the same thing is, of course, the Yeti. Uh, 
uh, which is a, a well-known, well-liked microphone. The Yeti Pro is particularly interesting because if you outgrow doing stuff by USB and you want to keep the microphone and use it in a standard studio, it also works as a standard microphone. You can plug in XLR cables to it. And that's a stereo mic that's actually very cool that goes for about $250, has built-in headphone monitoring, that sort of thing. Um, if you're just getting started, there are a few basic mics that are worth mentioning. I mean, the classic one that everybody talks about is the Shure SM57 because it's indestructible and it sounds good on a lot of different things. Uh, there are people who prefer uh, uh, their other affordable dynamic mics like the Audix i5, which is a very well-liked alternative to the SM57. Um, you can now get really good quality uh, large diaphragm condenser mics uh, for one or two hundred dollars, three hundred dollars. We'll be talking about a new mic that's really pretty impressive uh, from a brand new manufacturer called Roswell Pro Audio in our um, uh, in our October issue. Uh, a really nice microphone based on the old K forty seven capsule that uh, the U forty seven mic made famous. Uh, and of course, if you can spend a little more money, you can start getting into adding flavors to your mic uh, closet, like adding a ribbon mic. The, the 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 classic modern ribbon, of course, is Royer Royer Labs, which makes phenomenal mics. Uh, the the ideal is you want to get mics that are affordable and usable, so that they start out as being your only mic, and when you're able to afford more microphones and have a bigger mic closet, they still remain useful. There are still things that they're good for. So this mic doesn't go back into a box and gather dust. It's still something that you haul out frequently and get good use out of. So you're always going to have that 57 in your mic closet. No oh, hell what. yes. Yeah. Uh, that's In fact, um, my mic closet has grown and shrunk over the past 30 years. These days, because I do so much at the magazine and I'm not really tracking bands anymore, I've gotten rid of almost all of my mics. <laughs> and when I do my radio show once a week, my, my on-air mic is still a 57. There you go. Well, uh, we are uh, running out of time here, but I do have one last question slash sure. topic that I wanted to address uh, mm -hmm. from a user. Uh, are there more plug-in options for Mac or PC? Obviously, yes, there are more plug-in options for PC. Can you talk about, uh, A, whether that's necessarily a good thing, and B, um, whether someone who's starting out uh, you know, building a studio should necessarily spend a lot of time trying every plugin under the sun. Well, plugins are plugins are interesting. They can be a real time and money sink. Uh, they look very sexy. Uh, they often come in demo format so that you can get them and try them out. Uh, there are many different forms formats available. The primary reason why plugins for the PC seem to be more prevalent is because there are a fair number of small homebrew software companies writing VST plugins. Um, what you tend to see with folks who are trying to get themselves established professionally is that these days in the modern era, you're going to have three plug-in formats which are supported. There's going to be AAX, which is what you need for Pro Tools. There's going to be VST, which is the Windows uh, uh, platform that it was pioneered by Steinberg for Cubase, but which is now universally available in a lot of places. And then there's Audio Units. Audio Units was developed by Apple, uh, and Apple uh, uh, DAWs like Logic, in fact, only use Audio Units. They do not understand VSTs. The vast majority of serious plugin manufacturers will create a VST plugin and then use uh, transcoding software to create an audio units version. You should not let the presence or absence of plugins stop you from using the computer that you're comfortable with. There are tons of options out there. Uh, a lot are available uh, for free. If you're really strapped for money, you can find people who are uh, offering very good freeware plugins. I want to caution here that um, getting into cracks, plugins that have had their copy protection broken, seems like a very easy way to get started. Um, the problem is that if you ever develop any kind of uh, uh, countenance in the industry, if you're ever seen, if you have a high profile, uh, cracks can get you in trouble. 
uh, you know, software theft is theft. Um, if you want to learn a little more about that, go to uh, the IMSTA website, uh, imsta.org. Uh, they talk about how important it is to support these creators. These software firms are often one or two guys in a basement eating ramen. Uh, and it seems like you're not stealing anything when you steal this stuff. You know, I mean, information wants to be free and, you know, they can always make other digital copies. But the fact is, every copy that's stolen rather than bought is one less meal that these guys can eat. And eventually, I have seen companies go out of business just because they've been cracked to death. And the vast majority of people who do this, they're, they're more interested in sticking it to the man than they are in audio quality. Uh, their, they, their attitude is, you know, if, if this fantastic company dies, it doesn't matter to me personally because I can always go steal something from that crappy company over there. Uh, Universal Audio makes these phenomenal plugins for their UAD hardware. And if you ever see someone complaining online about the UAD stuff not being available in native format, what they're they really crack it. <laughs> yes, exactly. There is no reason for these plugins to be available native unless you want to steal them. So, you know, buy the hardware, suck it up. It's good. It's a good product. It's going to make your mixes sound better. It's going to make your tracks sound better. And the more money you're able to pump back into these really good companies, the more cool stuff they can bring you in the future. Well, so the, the, that's, other, that's, the other thing is that, you know, especially if you're just starting out, there's absolutely no reason why you can't make great music with the stock plugins that come mm -hmm. with any DAW. The, any the, DAW. If, it, if, if your music isn't sounding the way you want it to sound, the problem is not the plugin. The right. problem it, is anything it, other than the plugin. Yeah, the, and and people people seem to think that you know if I put this if I put this plug in in my audio chain suddenly everything's going to be magical. Nothing works right. that way. Some plugins the, the, are better than others, but there's well, no yeah. but there's no plug in that's going to make your bad mix into a good one. Yeah, and there's and and I think more importantly and more painfully to realize that there really is no plug in out there that's going to give you talent or skill or experience that you don't have yet. The component that's in front of the microphone, that's <laughs> that's the most critical component in the whole studio. And the component that's accepting the audio from the headphones or the speakers, you know, it's your ears, it's your talent, and it's your ability to work with the tools, not necessarily the tools themselves. Let's put it this way. The whole thing with Recording Magazine is we want to help you get good enough so that you can hear, appreciate, and use the difference between a $3,000 microphone and a $100 microphone. If you can't hear that and really make good use of it, there's more education to be done. And while you are working on that education, you can still buy really good, affordable microphones, interfaces, computers, and you can make good music that will get you in the running and get you going. And we'll take it from there. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll be back next month with another Q&A uh, with folks over Recording Magazine. So in the meantime, head over to creativelive.com slash audio and check out what's there heading over and head over to the recording magazine site check out what they've got going on and we'll see you next time